Welcome to the second episode of the Life Game Design Podcast. With this episode, we're talking to my brother-in-law, Fola. He's not actually my brother-in-law, but he's my sister's partner. And every time I talk about him to my friends, it's just easier for me to say that. He's the Senior Account Director at Forecast. It's an all-in-one AI-powered software for businesses to manage finance, resources, and work projects. He also has his own venture of Allegra Partners, which is an advisory firm that supports early stage startups with sales, business development, and strategic planning. On top of that, he's a songwriter and artist that has made some mad tracks. The structure and the apparatus, ask the income. Personally, to me though, he's been an amazing mentor in helping me with the process of bringing this idea of life game design to fruition. In our podcast, we go over his year in 2023 and map it out according to the Octacore framework that I developed into a Notion app called Life Game Design. Octacore is a framework that helps you understand, organize, and optimize every area of your life. And it's based on the eight areas of fulfillment that we can find in life, but also the eight areas of life that we need to manage in general. That I've made into a project manager that when you use it naturally, it creates a scale of your life. It shows you exactly where you're putting your time, energy and effort into. And it intuitively allows you to understand where you want to put that energy and effort into and how it feels looking at it based on this table. Previously, I was really addicted to games because they are so well designed for fulfillment. And the thing is, my life wasn't. So I started the series of podcasts to understand what fulfillment looks like for other people so I could find that for myself, but also help them redefine their understanding of what achievement is. Because I think we've all been told from the self-help narrative that we should start treating our lives like a business, but that's exactly why people are falling into the trap of burnout because their life has literally been designed to be like working for a corporate business. The thing is, life is so much more like a game than it is a business. But when I say that, I don't mean that we need to force life to be a game by using these gimmicks of game design like XP leveling algorithms and skill trees and all that bullshit. No, what we need to do is understand what is fulfilling in our lives, what have been the most fulfilling memories that we've ever had, and try to make more of them. Because what got me addicted to games in the first place wasn't all of those gimmicks that you see in game design. It was because I found the most fulfilling way for me to play the game that I loved. And I found that throughout my years of building this app, I've understood that if I find the things that are truly fulfilling to me in life, I will work so fucking hard to get more of it. Getting into the podcast, this is a year in the life of a tech startup advisor, my brother-in-law, Fola. Fuck, let's get it going, man. This it, is bro. the second yearly reflection that we've done. Tea, bro. And so tea. the first one, mm. that was a bit that was a bit too raw and uh, <laughs> a bit too raw to post. Mm. So we never did that. But I really I really appreciated getting to know you on mm. like a insanely deep level yeah. from just meeting you <laughs> and that's what's like now that i've done this with a few of my friends yeah i've learned so much about them just from having these kind of like end of year reflections where i learn about almost every aspect of their life within special whereas if you kind of talk about how's your year been with your friends normally yeah there's so much left out and i think the biggest <laughs> the biggest thing Probably that i found it. from doing this with you is like when i first asked you to list your achievements you had eight big things and they were big things they were awesome yeah but we've expanded that to an insane amount i think when i was looking here. at the notion i think total <laughs> just in like the third rank like the third medal yeah, we had fifty-seven. Mm -hmm. So from eight to fifty-seven, wow! <laughs> That's and it's just interesting. Like when you say we should go through it and like expand on things, mm. I think it's a valid point because there's so many things that you overlook within a year because it's your life and you just take a lot of those things for granted. Yeah, um, yeah, it's good to like take a fresh perspective. Also, I also think maybe I'm pretty sure there are clips in last year's episode that you could probably use. So, oh, okay, uh, yeah, let me know what you might go through. I'll, I'll, wanna, I'll probably go through just to see the differences that we had mm. <laughs> in terms of the conversation in general like yeah. where our minds were at kind of thing i guess the first thing that i want to go over in mm. terms of the reflection is just looking at the distribution yeah. of your achievements within the spatial framework and just thinking like how, how do you feel about it in general do you feel like it aligns with 
what you what your intention was with the start of the year or anything that surprises you? Yeah, that's a good point. I think what's here now is mm. a more accurate reflection of what my year has been like. I think yeah. maybe before, like what I had in my Google Notes or sorry, my Google Docs was more just like a snapshot of like what I thought was important rather than the things that had actually happened that year. Like for example, like even when we were downstairs and we were looking at the things that like fell into the experience category, I had nothing there, but like yeah. now I've got 11 things, one of which is like in the top bracket, which is just like crazy. So yeah, I think when I look at the distribution of this, I think it's a reminder of like how easy it is to overlook areas of your life that are equally important but just because of your own biases mm. and your world view it can be easy to overlook those things yeah but looking at it now yeah i'm happy with it like lots of good shit in here lots of good stuff in here i don't know can i swear on this lots of good stuff yeah. here and lots of points for reflection mm. on top of the things that i'd already said that i wanted to talk about um so yeah yeah i guess moving on to thinking about so you're, you're pretty happy with the result. Is there something that you would like to add in any of the categories? Like something you feel like you missed or mm. one that one category that you're like, wow, I can't believe I actually did so much in this category. Yeah, I think, I don't think there's anything I would add. Like as I was going through everything and I was ranking things like top to bottom um, or like using the middle system that you, you recommended, I wouldn't say that there's anything I would add. Mm. Like I enjoyed the expansion, but I think the thing I'm most surprised about not necessarily on like, oh, like one specific column. I just think generally speaking across all of the special categories, yeah. I am surprised at how many things that I would have left out mm. because they didn't fall into like the way I thought about my achievements that year. Yeah. Um, and like one of the great, great examples, like something that falls into the creative, like some of the things that have fallen, fallen into the creative uh, column, they, those were things that like I would have probably moved into work when you when you look at them from a different lens it's quite clear that like those are forms of self-expression as well as like forms of entrepreneurship or forms of innovation so yeah um yeah yeah interesting stuff totally man and i think it kind of hangs on the whole idea of imposter syndrome where mm. if you don't give yourself credit for all these things you've done and i ask you at the start of mm. at the start of this conversation like what have you done this year mm. and you've so we've got 52 weeks in a year and you've got like eight things. <laughs> like you haven't only done eight things yeah, this year. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. So there's so much that all of us aren't mm. giving ourselves credit for. And I mm. think it's because of the idea that when we look at things like self-help and stuff like that, mm. the authors from those books look to examples in business yeah. to prove their points. And business is all about productivity, efficiency, nothing about creativity, nothing about experiences, nothing about buying yourself things, nothing yeah. about looking after your physical health, mental health, all of these categories that we're missing out on. Mm. So I think, uh, and I'm writing a blog post about this at the moment, that yeah. a lot of the yearly reflections, uh, templates that I've seen that people are offering at the moment, mm. it's literally just two slices of life where it's like intelligence and contribution. Have you had a promotion this year? How many books have you read? Mm. How productive have you been this year? And then forecasting for next year, how more productive are you going to be? Where it's like missing out on literally That's all really these other areas of life. And the, sorry, yeah, go ahead. And this system is not only for productivity, but mm. the kind of hack that I've seen from the philosophy of game design in general mm. is that when you're more fulfilled, you will be more productive. So mm. it's kind of this, I call it the opposite access theory. So if you want to be more productive, being more productive is not the way to be more productive. Mm. You find a different outlet to get the result as a means to the end. So mm. fulfillment, I think is the best way to be more productive. Cause if you're, if you're trying to be something like successful, mm or trying to be happy, mm. you're not going to have the same drive as if it fulfills you because you understand that fulfillment has an amount of sacrifice to it. Mm. Whereas if you're just doing something for the happiness of it, mm. you're probably not as willing to go through as much adversity right. to achieve that thing. And so the reason why I set out this figure and not just made another productivity system is because one, there's so much more to our lives mm. and two, all of these things kind of feed into each other. Like you said, um, in your creativity section with Allegra Partners, yeah. that 
that made you grow so much in so many different ways that we'll touch on later that yeah. probably fit a lot into all of these other categories and the same with your journaling the same with doing your yoga and running and stuff like that eating healthy meals especially yeah. massive so improvement way, so. massive improvement yeah. man just on what you said about um just like these different purviews that I guess society can take on the individual mm. and their their sense of worth. I think it's really interesting because, like, I don't know what you coined it with that like theory, but it's the same way when if you observe a child who is just trying to play and just having fun, yeah. there is no trying about it. They're in a natural state mm. of, you know, creativity, immersion, and I think that's something that most adults like will you know, willingly or unwillingly admit to you and say like, yeah, like there is a loss of authenticity when you go into your adult life that comes from, you know, having to grow up, having your dreams crushed, all that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. And like one of the things I was saying to you earlier, I was like, phenomenal book, um, The Almanac of Navarre Rowikan yeah. was like finding that 1% of things that like, it's not just like you're good at this thing. It's like you are exceptionally talented at this thing and this is what society wants and you mm. found yourself to have an affinity with this type of work. Yeah. And I think that's something that's definitely missing. And I think when you explain it, like in terms of these dis different categories, it becomes a lot easier to find that kind of what I would call like blue space, like this space mm. that is unoccupied, that's very yeah. fertile, and like kind of, optimal for you is the same principle in ikigai like yes. that that inner 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 circle of the five circles that form the venn diagram mm. it's that space that you can occupy that allows you to to, to do your best work but it not feeling like work i think yeah. i don't know who i think there was a guy you said that you did this with uh a few weeks back one of your friends and you said that you know he was able to see quite clearly what his contribution was and i was like you know what? it's it's really interesting because it from any perspective on here, you can quite quickly see what people are naturally inclined to doing, what mm -hmm. they're willing to invest in, what they want to contribute to society. Uh, and maybe even what they're lacking. Like I'm seeing here, like some of my persistence is like, my persistence is the lowest, like it's three. But if, if I was to describe myself, I would say I'm quite a persistent person. Yeah. So I feel like it's just stuff that you haven't given yourself credit for, to be honest. Probably. Because persistence <laughs> is a mix of uh, the habits you develop, things you buy for yourself. Mm. Um, managing life routines and things like that mm. um and there's so much there's so much we could yeah. probably add to that but persistence i added as a life bucket that mm. not many people add in like life management systems so yeah. in terms of like uh building habits but also managing your environment in all aspects mm. so like the environment of uh your work life your room the whole like mm. jordan b peterson thing yep. clean up your room right but that would never be classed as a life bucket or category mm. in any other productivity system mm. because why, why do you think you value it why do you include it i started this off as a way to understand and organize every area of life so if i need to i need to organize the things i have mm. um and how to maintain them and stuff like that i needed a kind of like database system this started as like a database system yeah. um, but from there it progressed into the fulfillment matrix so all of these categories are different ways that we can find fulfillment in life and from there there's obviously different levels of fulfillment and I separated all of these categories into four elevating attributes and four essential attributes. So the essential attributes in the, in the context of fulfillment, the essential attributes of fulfillment are strength, your physical health, mm. life force, your mental health, mm. attachment, your relationships, mm. and then finally contribution. And that contribution changes in between work and charity and volunteering right, right. and stuff like that. Um, and so those are from, from all the books I've read, from all the podcasts I've listened to, those themes are always the ones that come up. So those are mm -hmm. kind of like your typical health, wealth, and relationships that people talk about. Mm. But if a life management system is just based on health, wealth, and relationships, it mm. misses out things you buy for yourself because things mm. you buy for yourself are fulfilling to you in different levels. Mm. Um, experience you you have mm. traveling watching stuff that inspires you all of these things um your creativity no matter what that outlet is whether it's playing the guitar whether it's having a new idea mm. things like that and then finally intelligence which is the last elevating attribute which is finance and learning so there's a lot of these very basic principles of things like you know money won't buy you happiness mm. that whole trope of that 
and have tried to put those kind of tropes into a system that actually makes uh, grounded sense within a framework. So that whole trope of like happiness, uh, money doesn't buy you happiness, mm -hmm. depends on what you spend your money on, mm -hmm. right? And so the whole point of the elevating and the essential attributes is to figure out what is going to the be the core of what fulfills me the most and then using mm. those elevating attributes to increase the fulfillment of the essential. So for to actually put this tangibly, mm. it looks like if you have your essential attribute of attachment, your relationships, right? Mm. If you just spend time with your partner mm. doing nothing else, there's going to be a certain level of fulfillment that you can get from that, but mm. you can't go beyond that. Mm. And so elevating attributes increase the level of fulfillment that you can get from that like experience so going to a new place with your partner okay drastically increases the level of depth and connection you can get from them learning about each other doing a creative act with your partner so creativity and attachment elevates the level of your relationship mm -hmm. learning something new together journaling together or something like that all of these kind of build up on one another and it's kind of the frame that i've used to understand how these different areas of life meld within each other, affect mm. each other. Mm -hmm. And especially touching on the zero sum game of time, mm. because you've done all this stuff this year, mm. but you had a limited amount of time to do all these things. Mm. So the distribution of the categories in special mm. would be different depending on how you spend your time in them. So if you're mm. going to spend all your time just doing contribution, there's obviously going to be a trade-off yeah. somewhere. You're going to have to, I'm not going to say sacrifice. Mm. Sacrifice is when I would say you didn't expect to lose something. Mm. I would say it's more of a trade-off when you understand, look, um, this year I'm going to put all of my effort into contribution or I'm going to put all of my effort into attachment. But that means there is going to be a trade-off. And you have to understand the different areas of life that you want to take away from in order mm. to incorporate that. So for me, things like experience. Um, I used to love playing games and stuff, but I don't have the time for it anymore. And it's gone from the point of, ah, oh, I wish I had more time to do this to be more like, actually, I would rather put more effort into my creativity than into experience from mm. playing games, right? Okay. And it's about Understand. understanding the trade-off of those things and understanding that you you need a balance of all these things mm. right so when you were when you had the turnaround in your diet which we'll touch on deeper later it was limiting your ability to contribute to show up in relationships to do all these mm. things and if there was no way to track it on a broad spectrum like this it'd be really hard to see the effect because i think when we organize our lives. It's in like five different apps. Mm. So your experience and stuff like that would be in Instagram, Messenger, Facebook, and stuff like that. Your work, work would be in a work app. So all of these things are separate and you can't see it from a top-down view to actually show you the effect they all have on each other, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So yeah, I think I want to check out your rankings. I l had a little bit of a skim read of your rankings and I was sure. pretty surprised with some of them. Okay. Um, but I want to go through just yeah. like a, the tier list, literally. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll go through them. Let's start at the top. Bear. Yeah. So Bear's obviously like Bear is not the best thing that I have achieved this entire yeah. fucking year. Like, let's just be clear. But it was, it was one of the best experiences. TV, it was one of the best experiences, yeah. best yeah. shows I've ever seen. For those that don't know, it's on Disney Plus. Go watch it. It's also on Star. It's about this Michelin star chef one of like the youngest, most successful chefs in the world um, who loses his dad. Mm. No, 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 who loses his brother um, and moves back to Brooklyn and start like takes over the family business, which is a sandwich shop, which is like yeah. shitty Italian restaurant right in the middle of fuck knows where. He turns it around into this incredible restaurant in New York, but for for loads of different reasons like i i rarely watch like tv shows through and through like i'm notorious for one falling asleep or two getting like three episodes in and then like i drop it but i watched this one all the way through and i binged it super fast yeah. so credit because it's just an incredible show it's an incredible storyline and it's 
the cinematography is like 10 out of 10. Mm. But the reason why I put it up there is because it's it's such a purview on what like the realities of success are. Like mm. it follows how traumatized and how affected this guy is as a result of like not taking care of himself throughout the experience of like this ascent to like extremely, you know, credited heights. Like you'd think a Michelin star chef at one of like the best restaurants in the world you know like he's got it made he's like yeah ticking all of these boxes but like the guy is completely distraught like he goes he has to go to therapy and he also faces like one of the base sufferings in life which is death Mm. and grief and i think it just it gave me a perspective on like what is important and it was it's kind of interesting because i I wouldn't say like i'm a mission star chef in any way but i would definitely say like i'm striving for a measure of success in my life that is like good enough that I can write home about my, you know, my parents and my siblings and my kids one day will also be proud Mm. that whoever I am to them has been able to achieve certain, you know, things in life. But like, it also made me realize that obviously there's a marginal cost. Mm. And I feel like film is a really good insight into human psychology and like the way reality actually plays out for, for us. So you see like scenes where, you know, he's just at home with his family and it's just like, horrific his mom is just like an absolute beep right yeah. she's horrible you can talk <laughs> toxic relationships with like his siblings and it's just all crazy but then they come together yeah to build this family business and it just showed me the complexity of life and i think i just really appreciated knowing that like even though it was a tv show like this act- actually life is just like crazy yeah. you know and i think sometimes we get caught up in like trying tr- like trying so hard to be humans that are civilized separate from nature in Mm. these civil like in these societies doing these things building these economies making these products and doing all of these things when when i it's like this paradox of like trying to create so much structure and so much organization in life that like it's just chaos like you take you take a rocket up i don't know how many hundred kilometers into the air and you'll realize it's actually just us here on this little floating rock just like here yeah i think sometimes we get caught up in in the bullshit, the bullshit of life. Yeah. And sometimes it just takes a TV show to show you that. Exactly. Um, and I, that's why I really liked it. That. It was a great TV show. That's awesome. Uh, first Christmas dinner with my family in the UK. Just, Ooh, I want to touch oh, on, God. I want to touch on beer actually, yeah, because it, it showed me a lesson that, especially from my experience from consuming media and mm. feeling like it was completely unproductive. And especially from like the self-development space where it's like, yeah. go do some fucking push-ups, yeah. <laughs> go read a book, yeah. you know, instead of taking the time to watch something that inspires you. Because yeah. there's a difference within the rankings of experience in itself where yeah. it's like you watch something like beer or mm-hmm. you watch something that you're just like literally numbing your mind with. Mm-hmm. There's a massive chasm yeah. of difference between those two things. And I think finding out what mm-hmm. actually calls to you and mm-hmm. incorporating more of that into your life mm-hmm. because beer is a way that you've actually kind of shifted it from experience into intelligence where it's become a learning to you Mm. about this whole thing of my idea of modern mythology because mythology that we've had previously is very inspiring, but it's outdated. What we need now Mm. is things like movies and TV shows and Mm. superheroes Mm. and these fictional characters and these stories that really teach us the lessons because Mm. that's how we evolved to produce our values from stories produce our belief systems from stories i think that like it's almost like i don't know what i don't know there there must be a saying somewhere about this but like Mm. i'm paraphrasing here but like it's all it's more about your quality of extraction than Mm. the produce itself like i could give you we could give the same person like water and flour and one person's gonna die and the other one's going to make bread, right? Yeah. Like, I'm, obviously, I'm exaggerating here, but, like, it's more about your ability to extract value from the world around you mm. than getting what you need immediately in your environment. Mm. And, like, I'm pretty sure there are people who have watched Bear and be like, how did this guy, make, like, get all of this stuff? Like, oh, he's, he's you know, he's reaching. It's such a far fetch. But, like, it's all about, like, what can you take from the experiences in your life mm. as opposed to what can the experiences, quote, unquote, give you? Mm. And I think... Um, like hustle culture will teach you like you have to go and do these like cookie cutter things to be able to get value from your life. Mm. But when you come into your own space and you you are like you are a value 
creating asset in and of yourself, like whether or not you're creating and publishing content, mm -hmm. whether or not you're watching the specific podcast that you're supposed to be watching because that's what your course, like doesn't really matter. It's like, can you go out into the world and be super curious and learn about things mm -hmm. and then extract those things, digest those things and produce things that are cookie cutter for you. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that, just like the worlds that we're in, just we don't like, that way of thinking about things doesn't get enough credit, I don't think. I think we live in a world yeah. where it's just like, if you don't know something, go consume some content to figure it out. And yes. like, there are lots of questions, especially in your like, or well, for me at least, right? In my like tw uh, late twenties, probably up until like my mid thirties now mm -hmm. that I will not have the answer to. Cause the answer isn't, the answer isn't out there, it's in here. Uh, yeah. I'm a firm believer of like inner work mm -hmm. and the inner world being a reflection of the outer reality, yeah. like, sorry, the outer reality to be a reflection of the inner world. Like, I can sit here and read every book and do and do all of these things, but like, if I can mine and harvest my own natural wealth, mm -hmm. I will be much more fruitful in any endeavor that I go on to do afterwards. Yeah, um, and like, bears just uh, literally bears an example of that. And there are books in here that we've we've talked about where I'm like, yo, like this is the book has changed my life. Yeah, and it's not even like the whole book. There's like a sentence. There are a few sentences in some books that we'll talk about. Yeah. obviously they're like just like i mean same with bear there are scenes in bear that i'm like that has it i can i can visualize that scene right now and yeah. i can tell you what that means to me you know mm. um so yeah just spinning off on what you said there That's but right, dude. yeah i like that so yeah i do want to go on to the christmas dinner with a fam in the uk first christmas dinner when i look at it i'm like what you haven't had you haven't had christmas yeah, dinner i'm like 28 <laughs> no, so, so what's the context it's like? a bit it's a bit it's deeper than just like christmas dinner. i think mm. um like, I think when you come from a family, and I'm just being super candid, right? Like when you come from a family like this, where there is like such harmony all the time, it's almost like unnoticeable. Mm -hmm. Like everyone is just like laughing and like shitting on each other, busting jokes and just like talking and like music and watching TV and arguing. tea and argue. All of those things, like <laughs> those, are, those are a reflection of a like underlying current that, is set by your parents, right? Mm. Your parents being the way that they are as human beings, mm. they set like a constant undertone of what the general vibe is like, mm. right? Yeah. But when you come from a family where like those, the the two parents haven't shared that space for as long as I have my own memories, I haven't had to have memories of like um, my parents like creating that type of vibe. Mm. I have memories of like being with my mom's side of the family and it being yeah. like, chill and like whatever and then i have some memories of it being a little bit chill with my dad yeah but i don't have memories with my younger brothers and sisters where like we were all together in a space at a time laughing joking eating tv not at a superficial level where like <clears throat> if they were here right now like, we could laugh and joke whatever whatever but like at the undercurrent level where like there is a clear like almost like non-verbal transition of energy like mm. i am calm and settled in my space and as a result of me being calm and settled in my space they are also calm and settled mm. and i think that christmas dinner was the first time i was ever able to create that for them wow. and yeah it's just like it's such a powerful like core memory in my life because i was able to give them something that that they I don't want to say that they didn't have because I'm sure they had great memories with their like sisters and uh, their mum and stuff. Mm. But I, I feel so obliged and so obligated to, sorry, I feel so obligated to like, to transform family karma and to break certain like generational cycles. Mm. So doing that, having that Christmas dinner, cooking the food, you know, making the menus on Canva, sending yeah. it to the group chat. Yeah, like you went getting, all out. Bro, getting all the Christmas gifts in, wrapping yeah. everything. You know, Jala was doing, Jala was doing literally everything under the sun. Like she was cooking, she was wrapping, she was cleaning the living room. We just finished packing the house. Then they all got there. Then we watched, all, we watched movies together. They yeah. stayed the whole day afterwards. Like, it's just everything I wanted. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can't, I don't know how else to say it. Like, that's mm. that's literally all, all that um, I aspire for, like, as, a, as, a, as an adult. Do you know what I mean? Like, there isn't really, a friend of mine lost his mum earlier this year mm. and I went up to go and see him. And like, for the first time in my life, like, I had like, I keep thinking, of, oh, like, I've had a revelation. I've never had a revelation until that that day. 
I went to, he went to go and bury his mom. I watched my best friend bury his mom. Mm. And then literally later that afternoon, I watched him and his cousins, aunts, uncles, all like giggling, laughing, being jovial, like just loving, loving heavily onto each other. Yeah. And it opened my eyes to like what, what, like what true, true wealth is. Like mm. True wealth is in your family. It's yes. in the relationships that you build. It's in the people that you can rely on. It's in the accountability. It's in the trust. It's in the immutability of those relationships. Yeah. And I think not like just because of like how culture is and how like capitalist structures work. Like you, you obviously we would be told to either be employers or innovators to build companies, to then employ people, to keep people in jobs. To yeah. then, do you know what I mean? Like that's how the system works. So it, it was like very calming and very like peaceful for me to like see something different and then also be able to try and replicate that in a space where um there's just been so much like family trauma do you know what i mean i just felt i was very proud i was very proud of myself and if i'm looking at the list now i would probably say that's one of the best like in my how old am i i'm 27 i'll be 28 next year in my in my life in my adult life post uni that's one of the best achievements of my life damn i would i would really love to see like imagine if you had this structure um mm. from the start and mm. seeing like what were what is the theme of the best achievements i've ever had in my yeah. life kind of thing they're all community and family oriented like i'm I, knew, I know that i'm like a big worker but like i think the work that i do is just like the work that i the work that i value the most is the work that i do for communities and yeah. like that is like impact driven mm. so like yeah i'm in tech yeah i work at com like work companies but like the things that i spend most of my time doing and trying to like optimize my outcomes for are always around like supporting minority groups trying to create innovation try and create access to capital yeah to insights for those people gotcha. um, and it all starts it starts at home like if i can't do that for my brothers and sisters what the f like respectfully like why the fuck am i going to go and do it for somebody else or someplace else it just totally doesn't man. i don't get it totally um man. but yeah mm, yeah that i just pulled up this uh yeah, the yeah. fulfillment uh matrix pretty much okay. uh, because like I said at the start, I started off special as a database to organize life. And mm -hmm. then I figured, actually, these are all of the areas that we can find fulfillment in. Mm -hmm. And fulfillment is the number one thing that game design is optimized for. And it's literally the reason why they use all this plethora of game design techniques mm -hmm. that get gamers hooked, absolutely hooked on their games, even doing boring shit. Like you saw my dad playing Elden Ring the other day, <laughs> yeah. going through mad stuff, right? <laughs> and he's just like, what? why <laughs> why would you do that mm. and so i i've read a lot of books on things like happiness and success mm. there is a plethora of books on happiness and success and breaking down the elements of those two things mm. but what i found is that i can think of a time where i felt successful but unfulfilled right so let's say um from a standpoint of like social media i can get tons of likes on a post on social media mm. but Maybe it's something that's not necessarily fulfilling to me, mm. you know? So it's like you get this yeah. happiness and it's like this empty happiness. Yeah. And so that's happiness without fulfillment. And in the same manner, uh, you've got success, mm. success without fulfillment. So mm. you do something that's like, quote unquote, successful, right. but it's something that wasn't truly intrinsically uh, meaningful to you. Yeah. And so you have this emptiness of success. This isn't something that I personally found myself in my life but i've seen it hundreds of times on episodes of modern wisdom and especially diary of a ceo mm. with all of these amazingly materialistically or in a business sense successful but they come on the diary of ceo and they open up about how empty they felt inside and i'm like how how yeah. do we navigate how do we navigate this to come to a conclusion where you don't end up in that space mm. if you don't want to i think i know someone person like very well who has like been on this journey the road to hell is paved with good intention man mm. um so i don't think any anyone that ends up in a position where they're like extremely successful but extremely unfulfilled as a result mm. intends on getting there exactly i think what ends up happening is you optimize for a specific outcome but like like most things in world like there is a action and there's an equal and opposite reaction so mm. when you optimize very very heavily for one specific thing mm. you often create the you create your antithesis so yes. you create your own downfall by doing that so when you optimize perfect example is like 
if nature optimized human beings, right? Like perfectly optimized us, mm. we would have one kidney and one lung and we'd all be dead. Because from an optimal perspective, human beings can survive on one lung as yes. you can survive on one kidney. But in doing that, you re dramatically reduce your chances of what? Survival. And then you end up gone. Mm. In the same way, like you optimize purely just for work and efficiency, you end up dramatically reducing other areas of the special framework, mm. right? You don't create time for attachment. You might not necessarily create time for curiosity and creativity. Mm. And you see it with lots of like extremely successful people from maybe a few generations prior to where, you know, they work really hard, they get great jobs and maybe they get like a few, not lucky breaks, but like opportunistic breaks, right? Mm. You you close a couple of deals that are a few million in revenue or whatever it might be. Mm. And that puts you on a path that's slightly different from your peers. Then you can invest in property and you buy a few businesses, you sell and then so on and so forth. Yeah, But as a result, you end up ostracizing yourself from like the, the very thing that, allows you to become successful, which is your relationships. Yeah. And the reason why I, like, I know this to be true is because I've, I've seen it firsthand. Like when you spend more and more time trying to achieve one specific outcome, you become a specialist at one thing and a generalist in nowhere else. No, nowhere, nowhere else. Yeah. So you, you create the conditions for you to be very, very good at that one thing, but mm -hmm. you don't allow you don't allow for any social mobility. You don't allow yourself to speak with other people from different backgrounds or different workspaces or different classes. And then that forces you to only establish yourself in one space. Yeah. Now, you imagine that on a mass scale in a in an economy where like relationships are what drives your interactions, right? It's not necessarily on the skills that you have or the work that you've done. It's like who you know is your currency and that's what you trade in. Mm. So over time, everyone is doing that. Everyone is ostracizing themselves and doubling down on the same space. Mm. And because relationships, what drives your productivity, it's not, it's not got anything to do with your skills. So it just yeah. breeds anxiety into these spaces. Anyway, I'm tangenting now, but um, yeah, it, it comes at a cost, man. Mm. Like especially when you optimize just for one success and you see it with people like what's the guy's name i can't believe i forget stephen bartlett yes right i asked episode or like clip where he's like yeah i used to just optimize for success and then i realized that like everything sits on the table of my mental and physical health so if i just mm -hmm. optimize for mental and physical health and then I do everything else that I endure on top of that. Like the rest will kind of stack. And it's kind of like you're building a pyramid mm. in the same way that you have like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You yes. have like human, I guess like fulfillment needs. And if you go go back to the to the special. This or? Yeah, go the back to the columns. Yeah, go back to the columns. Like if you, like when I look at, when, even when I'm thinking about special and I'm looking at this, I think to myself at its base level, Mm. like strength and life force form the base of the pyramid. Yes. Right? Like if you're not physically and mentally well yourself, how can you build relationships? Exactly. How, can you, how can you be in relationship with anyone else? Yeah. Like you're only bringing, what, 30% of yourself to a relationship where you're required 100%, probably mm. more. Yeah. Right? So you think, I think about it like that. And at the top, oh, sorry, at the top, I've probably got things like creativity and experience. Mm. So I've got strength and life force at the base, attachment, mm. intelligence, and contribution, and then mm. experience, persistence, Increasing. and then probably creativity at the very, very top. Mm. And when I look at it like that, I've got eight things in creative. Mm. So I would say just on that, I've had a very, very, very fulfilled year. Yes. You know? to the fact that you were able to have the privilege of. Yeah. To, 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 to say that I've actually, there's eight things that I think are of note this year mm. that means that my the base of my period is very strong and like when i look at the when i look at my pyramid actually i've got three in life force and i've got five in strength to i would me, say you're not giving yourself enough credit for on, those <laughs> um in terms of your achievements and those but, you know, and but yeah. i'd challenge you just on that and i'd say i think i'm giving myself specifically on life force mm -hmm. i think i'm giving myself all of the credit okay but because it's like the output utility that I get from those three things I see. just magnitudes and magnitudes above everything else here. Like yeah. if yeah. I, if I got my journal out and maybe another time I'll, I'll, I'll share bits with, with you, but I journal in a way now, like one of the other things here that I've said that I'm happy about, I can't see where it is, is that like I optimize my, my routines. I've optimized my journaling routine now. Yeah, like, I don't need, I don't persistent. feel the need to journal every day, but when I journal, I can journal for like 30 minutes to an hour and I yeah. can 
get everything I need off my chest. Mm. That's taken me eight to 10 years to, to get to that point. Mm. So when I write journaling there, it looks like it's one thing, uh, but that's a but decade of experience into one activity. Yeah. Same with like meditating. God, when did I become a Buddhist? I've been a Buddhist for like going on five years now. So mm. in just those two things, and the person that introduced me to Buddhism, I've known them for 27 years. So just in that, one, and again, this is, and this is going back to what you said earlier, right? Yeah. The way that these columns or these categories of special compound and kind of integrate themselves into other areas. Mm -hmm. My relationships, building my board of directors mm. directly feeds into my meditation and my journaling. Because mm -hmm. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have come so far in my meditation and my journaling if not for that board of directors. And there's a specific person on that board that like, yeah. this woman has just like transformed my life. Mm. But when I, when you, when you look at it like that, it's like, that's half my life in two, in two points of life force. Yeah. yeah. So it's mad. So yeah. Touching on the point where you have like <laughs> life force reinforcing your attachments. I, I said previously that they're separated into two categories of essential and elevating, but the thing is they both have essential and elevating properties, mm -hmm. but the elevating attributes like experience, mm -hmm. like creativity, mm -hmm. like intelligence, like you said, is kind of like a bonus on the top of a pyramid. Mm -hmm. They aren't, extremely essential to our fulfillment mm. whereas if we have something like attachment and life force they can definitely elevate each other Fully. and especially with the essential attributes mm. if you stack them and use them to elevate each other yeah it's insane like you just said let's take the example of 12 life dinners and journaling yes Didn't remind me again what the life dinner is so the life dinner is um it's like a, it's a dinner setting that you do once a month yeah. and you switch on who organizes it, who arranges it, whatever. Mm. And you sit down and you ask a series of questions that are focused on your relationship. Mm. You know, what's causing you anxiety right now? What are your general sources of fear? What are you proud of? What did mm. you love most about me this month? What can I improve on this year mm. or this month? And it just allows you to have dedicated time to focus on your relationship yeah. and how you are showing up for one another. Hi, I mean, like I have <laughs> notes, I have notes in a spreadsheet where I have journaled and written down like what I want to talk to Jara about in the next life dinner. I've got the questions on my Apple notes mm. and there are things that I have processed emotionally by myself so that I can bring my best self to life dinner. And that just, mm. and that's not even just life dinner. Like that just goes, like, interestingly, like I see the, like, you know, there's this concept of like the world within the world, like the universe, I don't know what the quote is, but like this, this concept that like the entire universe is potentially self-contained in like a single moment. It's the concept from Buddhism. Mm. But like, I can see how all of these, every single card and every single column for me, fits into journaling as an as a single activity. I can write about all of these experiences. I can yeah. journal, so I can exemplify and I can amplify everything that's here mm. through one activity. Yeah. And to, like just as an observation, that's just like a super super powerful, um, super powerful thing. Mm. And I'm gonna add. Mm, is it too late to add? No, you I'd, can do I'd, it. I'd, I'd add journal. I'd add something to journaling. I would add photography to that. Yeah, I wouldn't even say, I wouldn't say I'm a photographer in any way, but like, I've, like, I really went out of my way to like find all of my camera equipment and bring it here. I, re I went onto Facebook Marketplace to find this like, you know, semi shit digital camera yeah. that I could bring with me because I really wanted to like capture what life was like here. But in doing so, I've just realized that like, I really love taking it. Like my first like entrepreneurial project was like a YouTube channel. Yeah. And I used to like film local rappers and MCs and stuff in my area. I used to take pictures for them at their video shoots and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But it just opened my eyes to like how much, how much of a moment can be captured in a picture. Mm. Like when we were looking through like your guys' baby photos downstairs, it was like, those are just like, capsules like you know there's pictures everywhere in this house so mm. um i'm trying to i'm yeah i'm going off off piece but yeah it's just like as i'm looking at these cars it's just a really interesting way to have all of this information laid out yeah man the thing that i wanted to touch on was mm. uh the fulfillment matrix which is yeah. the basis of the whole special system um mm. and it kind of plays into these intuitive things these intuitive pieces of wisdom that we see where it's mm -hmm. like the, the greatest fulfillment that you can get is where you are in service of someone else. And so I really tried to put this into a framework because 
another idea I have is that we all have traits, uh, insecurities, and affinities. So traits are trade-offs we have. Mm. I'm amazing at making frameworks, mm. but if I don't have a framework to do something, I am fucking terrible at doing that thing. Literally, the management of my life. I spent, I spent five years developing the system, and until I developed it, until I developed it, I felt like I had no idea what the fuck I was doing with my life. Yeah. Even though I could have probably used some other system, if I didn't have a framework that covered absolutely everything, yeah. I feel like, what? what's the point? And that's kind of my trade-off. I have to have frameworks for everything. <laughs> so it's a great strength, but also a great weakness. Mm -hmm. And yeah, tying that into the film, film and Matrix, it's like we have to find... What are our trade-offs? What are our traits? What are our affini affinities? Mm -hmm. People would usually call that as talent, but I think in the modern age, talent means you just have this gift. Mm -hmm. But I think the gift it is, is dealing with the adversity that people don't want to go through. Mm -hmm. So I think I watched a documentary. Oh, it was a clip from a podcast about talking about the documentary of Michael Jordan, where mm -hmm. he would do so much practice that people would just, people would always call him talented, right? But mm -hmm. the amount of, the amount of practice that he would go through literally freaked everyone else out. And I think talent is that. Yeah. It's willing to go through all of that shit that no one else wants mm. to go through to get to that level of skill mm. in combination with the affinities he had, like, you know, being tall and obviously having those yeah. natural gifts that you would say, but also having the affinity to go through that. Mm indetermination of the goal. I think I saw something earlier this morning that was saying like self-discipline is like the highest form of self-love like, or something. I probably know like three people personally in my life that have that level of focus mm. and like diligence. Um, and I think it comes from that theme that we were talking about prior to in Naval's book, like just like finding that 1%. Like when you yeah. when you truly understand that like, there are actually some people that will live and die and never do what they're destined to do. It's like, it kind of hits you in a different way. And yeah. when you're able to one, carve out the time, but also then like have the emotional, like um, resilience to go through being shit at something that you're not mm. sure is even worth your time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like you might think, yeah, I'm sub I'm destined to be a photographer. And then you spend six months of your fucking life being a photographer to realize that it's not your thing. Yes. Then you got to go and do that. And you probably got to do that for about 10 years to find out what that thing, that is an, em that's emotionally draining. Yeah. Because you have to, all you're doing is going through, oh, I thought I was really good. This is, I'm yes. sick at this. Actually, I'm shit. And then you, ne you get here yeah. and then you realize this isn't for me. And then you just do that for like a decade. Mm. And then you get, Every time you go down the ramp, you go up a bit more, up a bit more, up a bit more until you surface up, okay, I'm good. And then you just go back to the beginning and then you keep doing that. That takes a lot emotionally to do that. So I think there's like a, there's like a resilience that comes with that. And I think once you, once you are able to find that space for yourself, mm. I think that's when you can spend like a hundred hours a week. Yeah. Like when I say that, some people will be like, oh, that's toxic. And I'm toxic like, well, grinds it. Yeah, yeah, it is toxic. But like, no one's complaining when you're like, and not to use money as a measure of success, but like, no one's complaining when like, you're 150 mil in and you've won mm -hmm. and you can completely check out of the game because you, you just did what was necessary. Mm -hmm. And then you can go and fuck off and live your life in like, the Bahamas, whatever, and not have to worry about like, no one says, oh, that's toxic. Because yeah. we have this like, we have this like, such we have such a warped perception of like what it actually takes to to live and acquire the lifestyle and the dream that like we mm. say we want yeah. everyone's like oh yeah i want to like live this soft life but like actually it takes a lot to to be able to acquire that and do that mm. so yeah yeah just like i say all of this to say the michael jordan mentality i mm. think is something that we would see a lot more of in society and it probably exists a lot it like occurs a lot more frequently than we think but people, the people that have it are just quietly sitting away doing the work. Yes. Like they're exactly. just, you know, they're in the bunker, just tapped in, like head down, you know, cracking your way. Totally. And like, yeah, I'm looking, I mean like, call it what you want. I'm looking forward to having my, having my, you know that part in, in every movie where like the crazy genius like has all these like flashing uh, calculations. Oh yeah. yeah He's yeah. like writing code. And shit. <laughs> I'm waiting. That's like that's what next year is for me. Like I had I had my first part of the film 
where I discovered my sword and I went to fight my demons and I've come out the other side and now I know what I need to do. Mm. And I've realized that like, yeah, I've got it now. Yeah. And now next year is like, I'm right code. <laughs> I'm right totally code. Man. I, re I really wanted to touch on the whole aspect of balance within life because that's yeah. what you were kind of touching on. And this is something I thought of within the special framework, especially because mm. I didn't intend this to be like, oh, you need to focus on this in mm. this period of life. You need to focus on this in this period of life. Mm. Going into, I guess what balance looks like in life so mm. obviously you may have a season of life where you mm. are that guy where you are that sigma grind set bro totally. monk mode all that shit you mm. know and then let's say the next year mm. you're totally carefree totally blissful focusing on the other areas of life so within here it's like it's the idea of uh, essentialism from greg McEwen, mm -hmm. in which you're gonna have different seasons of your life mm -hmm. and if you look at your life in a small section of time, it's always going to feel unbalanced. Mm. And so the key I found to finding balance in life is just literally broadening, broadening your time horizon. I'm because sure. if you look at this, this is extremely unbalanced, mm. right? If you just focus on habits, money, work, fitness, and ignore all of these things, mm. it seems like a terrible life. And if you do the opposite, again, it looks extremely unbalanced. Mm. But the way to solve it and depending on the difference in time, this is the bar that holds both of these things. Mm. That is perfectly balanced. Yeah, right. That makes sense. And I, so I completely agree with this. I've never. I, I'm not going to say it out like I've read the book because I haven't. Don't know it. But um, this concept of like, I've come across it from just like listening to podcasts on some of the investors that I follow. Mm. This concept of work life um dynamic yes so there isn't like but balance is like it's a hoax right because if you're perfectly balanced every single day like you'd actually never live your life yeah. right you need to go to university for four years or you go to you go to you know your apprenticeship or whatever it might be and then you know you have a holiday for you know i'm here for five weeks i'm not doing anything i'm not yeah. working i'm just traveling i'm experiencing yeah. right like if that was my life, that would I would never be able to afford to be able to do this kind of stuff. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it works in like sprints. It's like how a software company right might, you know, speak to their users right and say, okay, I need to spend some time working on, you know, the strength side of my app, mm. right? And then you spend two weeks working on that. Like your whole app is not just one. It's the whole of special is not just one S, mm. right? There are lots of different categories. Yeah. And I think I agree. I'm taking a much broader time horizon allows you to factor in more variability into larger segments of time right mm. so you can say this year like every year i pick a theme yeah yeah this the theme for next year is like the one percent right mm. i am not i think i was saying it to your parents when we were at the the dinner table you know like next year i'm not traveling Mm. you know i'm not going anywhere i yeah. i found where i need to be and exactly. next year is when i focus on that <laughs> yeah you know so <laughs> But I mean, I'm sure in years to come, I'm like, yeah, you know, I can chill now. I don't want to do this or I can take time off to do this and, and do whatever. Yeah. But I think one one of the things that I think that my dad always says to me or said to me is that like, life is about management. Like, and that's in relationships, that's relationships with yourself, other people, with work, your boss, you know, your, your partner, your kids. Mm. Life is about managing. So the quicker you become self-sufficient and organized with your capital whether that's with people's time money mm. you know labor property whatever you will be a much more efficient individual and you'll be more of a pleasure to be around and that's one of the pieces of advice that my dad gave me that has always stuck with me sure and it comes up you know, it comes up in conversations like this it'll come up again i'm sure but yeah i want to go on to some other achievements you had mm. But I'm surprised like how how much we've been able to talk just Dude. about these real <laughs> core ones. It's yeah. just it's awesome. I'm not even I'm not even mad that we haven't talked mm. about all these things because it just shows how much goes into like the mm. best achievements, right? Mm. What else have we got here? You might have to zoom in a little bit. Learn each other's communication styles. Woo! Interesting. This is a good one. What do, what do I mean by that? How do I put this like succinctly? I think in today's day and age, like there's there's a top level humor, but there's an underlying trauma. Right? Mm. And you see it a lot. Like when you go onto Instagram, it'll be like POV colon when someone does something, but they think something else, right? Like when my partner tries to tell me something and I'm not listening, right? 
or like when when my girlfriend like something something or other like that and like yeah. it's funny because it's a meme right yeah but like underneath that it's like it's normalizing some type of generational trauma mm. where you know someone is unable to go through something and learn a new skill and unlearn something else that that used to serve them hmm. that they now need to get rid of to move on into their like adult life. Yeah. And like, no one's perfect. Everyone has their own problems and everyone has their own ways of dealing with these things. Mm. Um, and a situation, I won't go into like all of the nitty gritty, but I'll give you like the, the high level. Mm. Yeah. A situation where John and I really were like trying to communicate with each other and we, we weren't getting through to one another in a way that was productive to either person. Um, so we just, we, we agreed to just like pause it, pause it as it was, yeah. take space, come back to it. Uh, and the reason why I put, and then after, after that had happened, you know, we had, a, we had a full conversation about it and we like, we went like, we went back through the whole experience, like step by step, like really going through like, you know, what were you trying to say? What was I trying to say? Okay, like we didn't see eye to eye because of this next one. And we did, we literally did that as if it was like, we were stitching through the experience, mm. step by step, line by line. But the reason why I put it there as like, one of the number one experiences is because, is, is because of like a couple of things. One of the things is that like, I hear a lot like from like my brothers and like some of my friends and then just like a lot on the internet, like, like our generation have a real issue with communicating how they feel, yes. I think. And I think, I don't, I, I'm not a psychologist, I don't know why, but I think a lot of things are kind of rooted in childhood experiences. Mm. I think we've normalized going to therapy and all of those things, but I don't think what we have done is normalized the true, re like the true process of psychological healing. Like there isn't like, oh, I'm now healed and now I'm done. Like healing is, an, is a life state. Like you're constantly healing, you're constantly developing, you're constantly, it's like evergreen. Because you're constantly getting damaged as yeah, well. Because exactly. <laughs> life, tra life is trauma, life is suffering, right? Anyway, so I think that being able to identify when things are not productive with your partner is like one of the key attributes that I I think allows for longevity. Mm. Like when you know things aren't going in a way that they normally go, like you have your benchmark and you know things are below that or well, well below that, knowing when to create space mm. and have boundaries so that you can come back to uh, uh, like uh, um, a common ground where you can both align for some end goal as opposed to like trying to be right in a conversation or something yeah. um and it's something that like i've seen in uh, in in other relationships but mostly in the relationship that i've had with myself and i think it really consolidated the, the impact of my meditation mm -hmm. like knowing emotionally when like when my cues are off and when i'm like okay like that's a bit sus or that's a bit sus yeah. you know and i think it's just one of the things that like i know and I've heard from like some, even some of my closest friends that they don't do. Yeah. And it just makes me appreciate like, bro, I've been with your sister for like two years. Mm. And one of my good friends who just got married, he's been in a relationship for, he's going to have his 10 year anniversary yeah. this year. He was like, yeah, like you're doing things. Like when I, I talked to him about our relationship and stuff and he was like, yeah, like you're doing things now that like me and Isabel only just started doing like this year, last year. Yeah. And I think it just made me very appreciative of like the emotional maturity that we both share, I think. Mm. Um, I know I've been a little bit cryptic about that because I don't want to like yeah, yeah, no, that's share cool. as much of the learning as possible. Because like, yeah, there's, there's there's so much about our like, love languages and stuff like that. But like some people just don't, like some people don't talk about how they feel. Some people are non-verbal communicators. Yes. Some people are very, very articulate with their emotions and they can say exactly how they feel in the moment when they heat, when shit's heated, did it right there. Yeah. I'm that person. I can feel so many emotions and just say it. I can just say like, this is, this is how I feel because of this. And I can trace it all the way back to like the place of origin, hold that moment, I can let that go. John is not that person, mm. you know? And it takes time to re realize and recognize that and move away from a state of pride to a state of compassion mm. and collectively move forwards yeah. as opposed to being like, you know, pointing the finger of blame yeah. or getting angry on, on both sides. Yeah. Uh, and it's just such a, it's such an insightful thing because that I wouldn't we, like, we didn't even have an 
I have John and I have never raised our voices at each other in mm. two years. But we've talked about some of the, I would say I've had some of the most difficult conversations I've had yeah. with another person with Jana. Mm. And that I think that for me is it's just very insightful. I think it's just insightful. Like I'm interested to see how that plays out. Yeah. To, you know I mean? I I like, oh, let, that's interesting. Let's see how that goes. Yeah. A, a uh, point that I that I really liked that you brought up was about the different styles that you have and the fact that you if something triggers you, mm. you can hold it kind of in your hand and mm. see it dictate the point of origin and communicate that. Mm. Whereas you said Jala's um, doesn't have the affinity for that. Mm. For that, mm. And it's not, you weren't talking about, oh, I need to like fix her to get into that space. Mm. No, because mm. I think that's the, if you first discover something like that, mm. you would think that, oh, I need to make sure everyone can do this like I do, mm. right? And instead appreciating her for the way that she wants to communicate mm. and the affinity that she has towards that. Yeah. And I guess that's the whole dynamic of the relationship yeah. in setting boundaries and yeah. being like, I don't need to mold her into what I want. Yeah. I need to accept her for who she is yeah. and work Do you with know, that. On that, I think, um, where, I don't know where I've learned this from, but like, that's not love. That's not, that's not love. Like loving mm. someone is not like, oh, what I think about this situation and how this needs to be resolved is the way. Yeah. Love is like, what's your approach? This is my approach. Mm. Can we move forwards together? Yeah. This isn't about like me trying to fix you because you could equally argue my way of thinking. If mm. I thought that, yeah. that way of thinking needs to be fixed. That way of thinking is broken. If mm. I'm like, oh no, you're wrong. I'm right. Yeah. You need to change how you are because I said so. Because my way is more efficient <laughs> or more. Do you know what I mean? Like that's bro. That's that's a flawed way of thinking because yeah. it's egotistic. It's narcissistic. It's mm. You know, it's selfish. It's mm. it's it lacks empathy. But when you're like, we are where we are, mm. right? You're in this. You think and feel how you feel. I think and feel how I feel. Okay, if we allow the dust to settle and us to like mend the woundedness and like have mm. compassion for each other in the moment, yeah, and know that we're both coming from a place of compassion. You yeah. know, we can do that exchange. Can we move forwards from that place? Yes. Okay, if we're gonna move forwards, where are we moving forwards to? Vision. Okay, how are we going to get there? Mission, mm. execution. Okay, can we move? And that's generally speaking in every type of relationship I've had, whether that's like romantic, uh, I don't know what the word is, like uh, platonic, like yes. platonic, non-platonic or whatever, business, familial, or whatever. It's all, every form of breakdown re-emerges uh, re from that type of thinking. It's like, okay, like can, we, can we move forward, yes or no? If we can, what's the vision? If we're aligned on vision, what's the mission? If we're aligned on mission, are we aligned on execution? Okay, let's move. And then it's just about like constant checking in. Like, am I doing, am I giving you space for yourself? Okay, am I, f do I feel seen and heard by you? Mm. If not, let's communicate, let's change that. And it's just like, it's constant ebb and flow. Are you, and, it, and to be fair, I think I got part of it from the lean startup. I know it's gonna oh. sound strange, but like, it's a concept of like, Building a business is like being out at sea, mm. lo being lost at sea at night with just a compass and a star. And on each island, you know, you pick someone up or you drop someone off. It's like, okay, you're gonna get on my ship. Well, I'm not a trained sailor. I have a compass though, and I have a vision. I, I know that we're going to the North Star and I, mm. I kind of can, you know, I can figure out how we might get there. Oh, well, I, I'm a chef, I can cook. Oh, well, I've got some potato. Okay, cool, jump on. And then we go to the next, and it's just, it's just about kind of like, each person that you pick on is a new version of the self. It's like, oh, I now can cook better. I can now, as a result of this, I can, you know, I can build more culture within the family network. I know how to um, earn more money. I know how to relax more. Mm. You know, I can go on holiday. Like all yeah. the and you yeah. and by the end of the journey, right when the sun rises, you have this team of people, which are all these different versions of yourself that you can bring to a relationship mm. that you now know as a unit, we can sail through the night and you've overcome that specific obstacle. Mm -hmm. And most of, I think most of life challenges is is less of a lack of like resource, like not having enough to do the thing as opposed to accepting that we have to let go of our pride to do this thing, mm -hmm. you know, letting go of, it's me that had the vision. It was my idea. It was my, mm. no space for that in relationships. Huh? The biggest thing that's coming to my mind when you say all of this mm -hmm. is that I read the short form version of nonviolent communication okay. recently. Um, so it's not the whole thing. 
um, but mainly skimming over the core concepts of it. Yeah. And it sounds like you've literally intuited all of them. <laughs> and I'm like, you haven't read this Shut book? Up. You're like, you got it. <laughs> you literally got it. <laughs> Tell me about the book. So, I, oh, the, I've only I've concept? only skimmed over the concept, but okay. the the whole concept of nonviolent communication is understanding that whole dynamic of like you're not trying to fix people, mm. you're trying to understand them to communicate with them. So it's not that you are creating an enemy. This is a this is a tangent of the Eight Rules of Love by Jay Shetty, and in the book he says like when you are arguing. There's a difference between arguing about each other's flaws mm. and difference between arguing about solving a problem. Mm. When you're so when you're arguing about each other's flaws, you are both enemies. Mm. But when you're arguing to solve a problem that you both have, mm. the problem is the enemy mm. in that sense. Mm. And I think that's a that's a massive mindset shift. Yeah, it's like me versus you. Yeah. As opposed to us, us versus, versus them. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay, exactly. Cool. That's like that. that's probably the one of the biggest takeaways. I got from the Eight Rules of Love, mm. um, among many more. It's mm. an amazing book, um, and unfortunately, I don't even have a relationship to use all this stuff. But I'm glad I know I know about all this stuff. So I when I argue, find myself, I'd argue against that. Like mm? you might not have a girlfriend, but like oh, yeah, you have relationships. That's true. All of these, like, and that's what I'm saying. Like lots of the things that, like lots of the learnings that I have had in my relationship with Jala mm. have come as a result from things that I have learned and developed outside of my platonic, of, of my mm. intimate relationships. Like learning to communicate with other communication, like other people's communication styles has come from a backdrop of patience mm. that I learned from just like when I live with my mom, mm. right? Or dealing with my dad or, you know, being there for my siblings or like dealing with like shitty bosses at work. Yeah. Like it's, the context in which the the skill is acquired mm. isn't always relevant. Like you don't need to have a romantic relationship to learn how to be good in a romantic relationship. Yeah, you might be. It's a transferable skill. You That's can. True. You might acquire it somewhere else. Yeah. Um. So yeah, just just picking up on that one. I see. I I guess the nuance mm. um is that when you're in the intimate relationship, you mm. just have so many more interactions mm. in order to build that skill. 100%, yeah. 100%. I'm not saying like, there's a threshold, right? Like not all of what I say is true, it's a generalization. Largely, there will be things, I mean like, there there are things that you don't learn about your partner, for example, that until you live with them. That's why people say, you don't know if you can marry someone until you live with them, right? Yeah. Like one of my good, good friends, the guy I was just telling you about who I speak to, whose 10 year anniversary is coming up, he was literally, he was like, yeah, like, like I didn't realize so many things about Isabel until we were in the same house. Like, li <laughs> like there's, a, there's a frequency of interactions that need to take place for you to then realize that you have a problem with someone's something yeah. before you realize you have a problem. Mm. You know? um, so yeah, 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 yeah. just thoughts. That's um, man, that was a good deep dive. Dude. Yeah. I like that. Is there anything you want to add um, within the whole 12 Life Dinners thing? Because that's... I would do say you know those what? are quite tied together. I assume, but you correct. Yeah, me. do you know what it was? I was just I'm just so proud that like we took a concept that was solely focused on improving the quality of our relationship yeah. and we stuck to it for a year. I do those types of like check-ins with like my friends, my family, whatever. But I I didn't I obviously knew it would have a good impact on our relationship. But I don't think I understood the level of clarity that it would bring. Mm -hmm. I think obviously like I can sit here and tell you that like, we went to some of the best restaurants i've been to and yeah. i've been to a lot of good places like we went we just had amazing food because we both have a really high appreciation for good quality food yeah but um yeah man and i wouldn't even say it was like the conversations per se like we talked about lots of really interesting stuff we talked about lots of difficult stuff as well mm. but it was more about the impact that that had like it built trust it built respect and it also allowed us i think for me at least it allowed me to believe and feel that I could go to Jala about things that I was concerned about and I could go to Jala about things that, you know, I wasn't happy about. And I think as a man, like, you know, fucking shoot me down, I'm gonna say some, get, get some canceled shit right now. <laughs> but like, I think sometimes as young men, like we're so in this mode of, we are figuring things out, but we have to appear polished mm -hmm. a lot of the time. You know, you've got 15 year olds on YouTube making like, 10, 15 million. You've got tech entrepreneurs who are in their early 20s, like 
owning companies, owning shares in companies that are over billions and billions of dollars. Like yeah. we live in this world where being young, successful, polished, and rich or esteemed is in it's it's not the norm, but it's passed as the norm in the media and. What I think it does, to me at least, I don't want to speak for all men, but psychologically it creates this idea that I cannot appear that I don't have my shit together, mm. right? And it's really difficult for me to be like, I'm working on this thing and I'm trying and I'm trying. I haven't actualized my potential yet. Yeah. You know? But having life dinner helped me realize that like, it's okay. It's okay to not have it all figured out. That's why you have a partner. And I think I say partner, I say partner, but like, I think this year I really understood what that meant. Mm. It meant that like, I, I have a co-founder in my, in the business of life, <laughs> yeah. right? In this thing where we manage our expenses and we have the notion page and all of this shit. I have, there's someone that I can go to that actually, I don't really know what to do about this thing. Can you do this? Can you do this thing? You know, I think, I don't know where it was in this, but like I was telling you earlier about um, picking out outfits. Uh, yeah. Like as a guy, I don't want someone to tell me how to dress. Yeah. But I can defer to uh, someone who knows more about dressing. Yeah, do you know? And, it's, yeah. and as soon as you realize it's an ego thing, off. I was like, yeah, yeah. pick out my clothes. Tell me what I should be buying. It's delegated. And then she's, you know, and I've got someone there in the changing room. He's telling me, yeah, wear this, switch that, wear that, da 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 da, da. And I think it just, Life Dinner was like the, the foundation that created that level of trust. Um, and allow me to remove that ego mm. and to bring my unfinished version of myself to the table. Not thinking that like that's, cause I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm saying a lot here, but like, I think in part, like it's like this idea that, oh, if I, if I bring my unfinished version, then what is motivating me to build the finished version if I've already brought my unfinished version to the table? Mm. And I think when you realize that like, actually you have someone who is investing in your unfinished version with mm. you you multiply by a hundred percent firstly your capacity because it's not just you it's you and someone else yeah. and then it's your combined ideas and productivities together investing not just in you but also in the other person yeah and like it's great man like yeah there's there's so many things in life that, about life dinner yeah. that are just like so great that I think life dinner should be something that's done by like any anyone that you interact with like every day you should have life dinner you know I'm totally going to be like I high, honestly highly highly recommend it man. Mm. like and I would even go as far as saying don't go out do not go out to a restaurant and have life dinner mm. because there are things that you want to say and tangents on the conversation that you want to have that you won't get the opportunity to do at a restaurant go out someone goes and buys the ingredients create a menu or don't create a menu, just pick a dish, cook the dish together, mm. sit down, no phones, literally just pen and paper, and maybe get your voice memo out, record it, whatever you want to do, have your notes, and talk, drink, be happy, be merry, even even more so on the difficult things. Mm. Because it's in it's it's being able to navigate those uncomfortable emotions with that person present and mm. being wholly present yourself, that's like the true value. Yeah. Like, um, do you have an overarching structure for that? Yeah, I've got like, a set of questions. I'll send them to you. Yeah, I'd love to um, see it, man. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's not my idea. Like, shout out. I, I forget the guy's name. Systems. Ah, uh, Ben Mir. Yeah, Ben Mir, System yeah. Sundays. He's the one that tweeted it. Uh, I don't know who he got it from, but like the concept was that. I think he got it from some investor. So shout out to the investor, whoever it was. But yeah, honestly, changed my life. Changed my life. And it will, And the maddest thing is, it's not, it's not like I'm going to do this now for the rest of my life. I will do it when I have kids. I have life dinner with my kid. Oh, it should be a rotating one-on-one. -on -one. Like yeah. every single weekend, one hour, two hours, whether it's a car drive, a walk, after swimming class, whatever. It's like adding gold to your house. Like mm. it just increases the value of the foundations. It's like mm. building the structure of your house on concrete rather than sand. Like it doesn't matter what comes. Yeah. Shit is good. Yeah, I guess the overarching concept of, right. ma of matching life force and attachment mm. and having the consistency of a safe space to talk about mm -hmm. both the good, mm. but also the bad mm. and the in-between of what you want to improve and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I think all of those concepts together yeah. is the reason why it's so effective. Oh, 100%. And I think, yeah, man. Yeah. I want you to teach me about the drama of a gifted child. That oh. title sounds really interesting. Okay. Right, let me get this.
and I'll, I'll forward you these notes as well. So basically, the drama of the gifted child mm. is a book by this lady called Alice Miller, mm-hmm. and it explores the importance of child childhood development or childhood experiences mm. on adult psychological development. Some core concepts in the book. So it basically explores this notion of like the gifted child and the basic premise of a gifted child about the concept of a child that grows up in an environment where they are not able to access unconditional love from one or or both of their parents. Mm. And as a result, the gifted the gifted child learns how to be gifted by adapting their behavior, their emotional expressions and their personality to serve the parents' needs or wants. Kind of standard example is, you know, a parent grows up in a household where academic achievement is equivalent to unconditional love, right? Unless yes. you do well in school, I, then I will love you. Then I'll, you know, whatever, whatever. They yeah. don't do that that well in school. They go and have their own children and then they impart the same conditions on their own child. Instead of the child being like, oh, I'm not doing that well in school. They mm. suppress how they feel and to meet the needs or the relevance of themselves in the world of their parents, right? Because when you're a child, you only you only really fathom that like you, there is a world outside of your parents when you kind of grow up. Like for a, the majority of your early life, like your parents' approval is the only thing you're trying to get. So yeah. when your parents like, okay, like if you do well in school, then I will, you know, buy all this stuff and treat you, whatever, whatever, mm. whatever, show you the love, make you feel safe, whatever, whatever. Yeah. So the child's gift is learning to um, suppress their own emotions and meet the needs and be hypersensitive to the world of the adult. Mm. That's the basic premise. And the idea is that like it has a massive impact on childhood development and it expresses the importance of emotional expression. There's a, it says it stresses the genuine need for emotional expression and the consequences of stifling a child's true self. And I've got okay. some... I've got some highlights yes. um, for you on here. Let's go through it, man. This is actually making me think of a, of the whole concept of the parent-child relationship we have with yeah. ourselves. Um, oh, yeah. D- this is something that I came think, up last year. Yeah, I think I'm really going to love this. I'm, I'm definitely going to read this. It's wicked. So here's, a, here's one of the quotes. So the child has an amazing ability to perceive and respond intuitively, that is, unconsciously, to this need of the mother or both parents for him to take on the role that had unconsciously been assigned to him. The role secured love for the child, that is the parents explo- That is his parents' exploitation. He could sense that he was needed and that this need granted him a measure of existential security. The ability is then extended and perfected. Later, these children not only become mothers, confidants, confronters, advisors, and supporters of their own mothers or parents, but also take over at least part of the responsibility for their siblings and eventually develop a special sensitivity to unconscious signals manifesting the needs of others. Um, I've got a whole bunch of other highlights here. I don't want to go off too much on a tangent, but the basic mm-hmm. premise, the reason why I found it was really important, because I think this year was really transformative for me in terms of looking backwards and forwards at the same time. Like I did a lot of planning for last year yeah. and I really thought about what I wanted to achieve and I pretty much achieved all of the things that I set out to. Mm-hmm. But by the by the end of the year, I had ticked off basically everything that I wanted to. So I was like, okay, like, let me just sit down and pause and just look at, like, just look at myself a bit more bit more critically so i started reading so i listened to some more podcasts and i did that dopamine detox so i had no music no social media nothing just writing just work one of the things that i learned was that so much of so much of like what is so much of what drove me to success was anger mm. and pride i had so much i just feel like i had so much to prove man like yeah. i had so much to prove and i wanted to be something I want I inadvertently wanted to prove to my mom that like she her like her health couldn't impact me. I know this is gonna sound it's gonna sound so messed up, but like psychologically, I I always felt that like sometimes my mom's health held me back. Mm. And I wanted to show to her like like no one can hold me back. Doesn't like you not you, not dad, not, not nobody can hold mm. me back. And I also wanted to prove to my dad that like I I am capable in and of myself. And 
what that translated to was to try and in, not necessarily be better than my parents, but it translated into like an obsessive personality that was focused on doing the right work, but for the wrong reasons. And it was in, it was in self, it was in reflecting on some of the achievements that I had, but also, and that, that quote, these children not only become mothers to their parents, but also take on the responsibility to their own siblings. It was only when I started to really like be there for my brother that I realized that so much of that empathetic capacity came from my personal trauma with my relationship with my mom and like the absence of my dad in like my early, early adult years. Mm. And it was when I was reading this book and I was looking at like the body keeps score that I was like, oh my gosh, like I've just been living out this life narrative of, nah, I need to do this because I'm better than this person. And if I, then if I do this and achieve this thing, then I will be worthy of like my own self-respect and my own self-love. But it was, again, like some of the other things that are in here as well, like things around like eating better, mm. like being more restorative with my health, running, swimming, going to the sauna, you know, doing like some of my yoga that I've only recently started doing, maybe about a month and a half, and then going through that that meditation kind of cleanse. It just gave me a level of clarity that I I always thought that like it was beyond my reach, but like mm. I see with such like such vivid clarity now that a lot of the things that used to phase me, they don't phase me. And I'm not saying I'm like free from like my childhood now, I'm like, but I'm definitely like I definitely have a stronger cognitive component now. Like I'm not mm. so pushed and pulled by my subconscious mind mm. or like underlying traumas. Like I was saying, like I'm, I'm very capable of feeling an emotion, like reactively, just letting that be there and then following it all the way back to the source and then just like holding space for that, holding compassion for that emotion mm. and then just like allowing it to be. Whether it goes to now, just allowing you know, allowing space for that emotion. Mm. So yeah, that's why that book, and just generally speaking, like diving deeper into psychology this year has really opened my mind um, to the importance of like good parenting. My favorite part about that is mm. that whole idea of having an emotion or a thought that comes up and not <laughs> demonizing it, not saying that, oh, this is so terrible that mm. I thought this mm. kind of thing. It's so horrible, but holding space for it, understanding where it's coming from and all mm -hmm. that stuff. And it's literally sounds like what a parent would do for a child if they found themselves in that same situation. Because I think when we're children, we don't have the cognitive capability mm. of doing that for ourselves. Mm. And our parents try to give that ability to us. They mm. try to give us that independence of Fully. managing our own thoughts. Fully. But the thing is when we when we start to gain independence, we forget to actively do that for ourselves. Mm. And I think modalities like journaling and meditation is exactly the practice mm. to be able to come to that conclusion. And I think there's the whole <laughs> boom of mental health, mm. mental health awareness, talking about mental health. And again, from my trait or trade-off where mm. if I don't have a framework for something, if I have this thing, this ball of mess in my hand called mental health and I don't have a framework to navigate it, it means nothing to me and I can't do anything with it. I can't mold it from a mess of circles mm. into a square mm. that I can perfectly place. And so I think the biggest thing that I've discovered this year as a concept is the duality of our subconscious and conscious mind being the parent and child relationship. Mm. And I've seen it from all of my friends from myself and exactly what you said about becoming a better agent or a better parent of your subconscious mind. Mm. Because if you realize from the story of Bissell van der Kolk, the body keeps score and mm. a one that branches off from that, which is by Gabor Mate. Yeah. Yeah. I hear yeah. you on that. Um, you said something just now about mental health. Uh, and this is one of the things that really opened my mind to just like how much bullshit society is like i think if you go and speak to anyone that has really 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 like sat down and done the work and when i say sat down and done the work what i what i specifically mean is like mm. they have voluntarily involuntarily 
in some way, shape or form, spend hours with themselves. And I'm not saying alone in some cupboard fucking somewhere, right? I mean, like, they've actually cultivated a level of awareness mm. above the threshold that you would, like, say, oh, yeah, like, not reading self-help books, but, like, they've really, really sat with themselves and they've come to confront what I would call, like, the shadow, right? Mm. The concept from Jungian psychology, which is, like, all of your evilest, worst, dark, parts of yourself and you've really tried to integrate and welcome that side of yourself anyone that has done that will tell you all of this stuff in that you see in in the media is crap like going through that process it's hands down the most it's a traumatizing and it's a horrific experience to speak to make space to go and visit your own trauma mm. and be with that version of yourself and show that person that side of yourself love and compassion that's the ultimate work. Like, that's really what meditation is for. That's really what journaling is for. That's really what all of these self-help books are for. That's, that's really that's why you go to the gym and you work on your body because it's a form of self-respect, all of those things. And yeah, I just like, bro, I, Jada will tell you as well, there, 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 I can count. I can count the times that I have meditated for over an hour and not cried profusely afterwards on two hands. Every single time I, you, you're so like, I think I just think there's this like this whole like glamorization of like what it is to actually go away and do the work and come back knowing that the work will never truly be done. Like my mentor, I called her one time and this was after having done a lot of like a lot of meditation. And I said to her, I was like, like I don't I, I have this like deep, deep like whenever I meditate, sometimes I have this like immense I think I said this to you. I had this yes. immense feeling of emptiness. Like it's like the whole it's like everyone on the planet just died. Mm. And it's just me left by myself and I'm just here. It's mm. horrible. And she was like, there isn't there's no escape. There isn't like there isn't like something that I'm gonna s I'm gonna tell you now that's gonna make you feel better mm. and it's gonna take it away. And it's gonna take it away and then when you go and meditate you're gonna be okay. Like that's not gonna happen. And and her words were there are never enough tears. So cry into the night, mm. cry. Like, and from that day, I was like, why does, why does it like, why does everything have to be this jovial, blissful thing? Yeah. It's like, oh, flowers and like, no. Sometimes things in life are actually fucking awful. Yeah. And like, the sooner you accept that, you can move on and really have a sense of compassion and gratitude. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to spin off on that. I say, yeah, man, like, I think a lot of people will just talk about like mental health and doing the work. Like, try living with someone who's had mental health issues. You'll see, if you've got mental health issues, go and do the work yourself. You'll see, if you just want to have a deeper sense of self-awareness and, like, a deeper sense of compassion, connect to your own trauma and that will connect you to the world around you. Mm -hmm. Do the work, you'll see. Building on that, because mm -hmm. w when you said, the point that really got me is that <laughs> the work never finishes. And yeah. I always, okay, so I understand, I heard it, okay, the work never finishes, why? Why? And I didn't understand until it's like, it's just mm. like a parent-child relationship never finishes. Mm. There's always going to be things that come up mm. that you have to, that you get damaged from, that you heal from, mm. and all of those things. Mm. And I think within the frame of the achievement of whatever this thing is called mental health mm. is happiness. Again, if we look at it from this abstract and don't treat it like a relationship with ourselves. Mm. And again, from our inner child, it's like, if you see a child who has great mental health, they still cry, they still have mm. tantrums, they still have all these things, mm. but they have a parent to help them guide them through all of that stuff. Mm. And I think what I realize now is that our relationship with ourselves is the same. If we have good mental health, it means we are going to go through these things mm. over and over. And I think... The difference is that we are able to pick ourselves back up mm. and not destroy ourselves in that rut. And like you said, mm. when you have a problem like this feeling of emptiness you feel, mm. it's not that you need to find something to take it away. Mm. You need to understand and give space for that. Mm. Not with the expectation that I need to fix this. Mm. Because if I think, again, if we're treating the, the frame of mental health as a parent-child relationship, mm -hmm. right? If I... If I, as a parent, tell my child, you have this problem, you shouldn't feel this way, mm. how is the child going to feel? And that's our subconscious like thoughts. Said. Yeah. I think there's a common misconception between like what we would, 
in like in in the Buddhist community, what you would commonly call like bliss or joy, mm. versus what you would commonly call like happiness in like Western pop psychology or pop science, right? Like mm. bliss and joy, you could say is like complete euphoria, right? Like it's the absence of ego, you know. Like it's like what you feel like when you come, like you know, without <laughs> being weird. Like it's, it's, it's like just like complete silence and absence from your own mind. And I think like lots of like mental health stuff is like geared towards like a blissful way of life like blissful a blissful state of mind yeah but like i think from my own experience like true happiness is not bliss like true happiness is your your ability to go through all of life's experiences like the resources the capacity and the ability the willingness to go through like losing a parent you know losing everything you've worked for uh, so being sick, going through the sufferings of what we call like the sufferings of birth, life, and death, and sickness. I think like when it, when it, if we use the same example, right? Like I was looking for bliss. That's why I called my mentor and I was like, I'm f I feel empty when I meditate. Mm -hmm. And my mentor told me there's there isn't like medit like peace. Peace, inner peace is not bliss. Inner peace is inner peace, and inner peace is a state of having everything you need to be to be okay mm. and that's just the resources to take on life's problems so when i think about like why i meditate why i journal why i do all of these things it's, just, it's more about like it's more about resource allocation like do i have what i need to take on life's problems like some problems in life as i'm coming to this is one of the big lessons for me that i think is coming next year as well like some of life's problems cannot be fixed some mm. of life's problems can only be managed like there are going to be there's going to be things that you will take on in life that like there is no fix because they evolve like the problem of um, poor health, right, today to you is just like eat well, sleep well, don't smoke, don't drink too much alcohol, don't take drugs. Mm -hmm. But like in 50 years, that's going to be completely different because you're a human being, you're biological matter, you decay, mm -hmm. age. Same with financial problems. People think, oh, like if I get super rich, then when I've got all the money, then I'm good. Well, actually, if you think if you if you knew how money worked, you wouldn't think like that. It's not about just having like a million pounds cash or all of these assets under management because then you have to manage the assets. Mm. You have to pay your taxes. You have to make sure that you know you've got good relationships with the people that are helping you manage these things. Mm. And also, too much money is, is just as much of a problem as too little money. You see it with people that are the first in their generation or first in their families to be excessively wealthy. Tyler Perry was talking about it on a podcast or on an interview the other day. In the first five years, he gave away his entire wealth in cash to relatives because he doesn't come from, like he doesn't come from a space where people are good at managing money. He's like, we need to pay for this healthcare. This person needs to go to school. This, this, this. You've got no money by the end. Mm. That's a problem. But you, people, people, I don't think, I don't think people understand like. And me included, right? I'm not saying I'm like, I do not understand the complexity of life. Mm. I think we oversimplify things. Um, and like respect me, me included with like concepts, with frameworks, with ways of being. Mm. And I think this year, especially like the tail end of this year with like the, the dopamine detox and just like a lot of the journaling, I've just like been able to escape the structure of my, like my own way of thinking like my just like my obsessive nature to like have a block that I can pour my water into mm. instead of just pouring my water and like whatever happens whatever happens yeah as opposed to oh that's a waste of water it's like just pour, you know just focus on being in that flow state focus on pouring yeah honestly when I see all of the achievements <laughs> you've made so much yeah. there's so much there and it's so good because again we started from Eight. And I think you said mm. it amounted up to 50 plus or something now. Mm. And that's honestly, that's honestly amazing. And just being able to reflect on the year. Mm -hmm. And you've literally shown me how much you've grown through all of these experiences that who knows, maybe you wouldn't have given yourself credit for mm. things like beer, yeah. <laughs> especially True. with an experience. And I think when you take structuring your life like a corporate business or something like that mm. that is not sustainable the old corporate businesses because yeah. i know you you really mm. enjoy <laughs> you really enjoy that analogy but mm. i think what i'm referring to is that old style where employees are replaceable mm. and that whole idea of 
efficiency, productivity without thinking about balance and those things. I feel like a lot of self-help authors structure their advice to organize your life based on that. Mm. And it leads to things like burnout, things like imposter syndrome, because mm. you haven't achieved as much as these guys are. Mm. You haven't been efficiently productive by watching beer. Mm. <laughs> like, what are you doing, bro? Yeah. <laughs> where where are the stats? Where are the yeah. finances? Where where are the where's the evidence that you're going to show that you're being productive? Yeah. And I think life is so much more like a game mm. than it is like a business mm. because there's things that we don't have to do that fulfill us so much mm. like watching stuff like sitting down and meditating we don't have to do that we mm. don't have to go to the gym but within games there's things that you have to do for the quote-unquote main story mm. and there's things that you can do for fun on this side mm. and i think the meld of life is understanding the balance of those things and i think what self-help really lacks today is understanding these different areas because again my biggest gripe is the whole health wealth relationships thing mm. as in like oh this is how you organize your whole life mm. but my whole life is not just health wealth and relationships and again i think it's a very untapped gold mine mm -hmm. into productivity and life management that game designers know to a t because mm. the stat really surprised me that i learned earlier in the year the gaming industry is larger than music and movie entertainment combined. That's crazy. That's crazy, right? And so oh. I attribute it to the fact that, okay, if I think businesses, mm -hmm. right? Businesses optimize for profit, right? So if we take the mindset of this self-help that we're looking for to be more productive, to be more successful, happy, and ultimately fulfilled... Mm. we're looking from a model of efficiency and productivity. Mm. Whereas if we look at game designers, what is their number one objective mm. to make the player fulfilled? Because if the player is not fulfilled, they put they it do, down. Yeah, do. So in business, all the focus is on the profit. Maybe the last thing is the employee who has mm. to do the work to generate the profit mm. within game design. It's all about the player. Mm. It's all about the concept of, helping them enjoy the process, making it as clear as possible and mm -hmm. all those things. And so, yeah, man, what you've really showed me is the intuitive way of getting to that point mm. where you've taught yourself the things that you really need to do from that more positive aspect, mm. that more positive aspect of treating your life like a business that is meant for the long term, mm. not the replaceable employees and stuff mm. like that um man i feel like i've learned so much from you and there's so much i need to learn from mm. you especially in the books you've read in the the life dinners that is yeah. definitely something i'm going to steal and when i get to that point in my life i am going to ask you for a lot <laughs> of advice <laughs> within I'm approaching here, that man is there anything else that uh you want to mention within the other Factors of achievement. Yeah, no, a couple, a couple of things. First thing, that Harvard longitudinal study where they like study people over like eighty years or something from yes. like their birth all the way till they die, and they they ask like, oh, like what, what, like what's the key to life's happiness? And I'm like, personally, I'm just like absolutely dumbfounded that pe like not enough people like know about this study and whatnot. But like, it's it's one of the things I'm gonna live next year by. Yeah. I keep saying like next year is about the one percent, but it truly is for me. The quality of your life is dependent on the quality of your relationships, mm -hmm. like your most intimate relationships or most frequent relationships. Mm. I would say the relationship with yourself. Most yeah, yeah, like relationship with self, your parents or your partner, your kids, and then your colleagues are yeah. probably so like those are the top three, top four. So like don't necessarily focus too much on, I'm not going to focus too much on optimizing for relationships, but like just have that in the back of your mind when you're like making decisions, like is this going to benefit the relationship? Is this going to like, what is this going to do? A quote, planning is everything, but plans mean nothing. I like, I know, I know quite clearly the things that I'm planning out and like how I'm going to execute on all of these things next year, but I don't have a plan. And this is the first time next year, this this year, in the next 12 months is going to be the first 12 months, I don't have like Q1, Q2, Q3. Like the only thing I definitely want to do is like, obviously like take care of my, my health and keep journaling, all of those things. Those are just like habits now. Mm. I want to save, I want to learn to drive and I want to do well at my new job. And that is it. Whatever happens, whatever happens. And then the last thing was that tweet that I wanted to... Oh yeah, let's go through it. 
So this is from a conversation between Sam Altman and Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, might have come out like well early this year, but it says, pick something you care about and work on it, but don't commit to turning it into a company until it's working. A tremendous percentage of the very best companies didn't come from people who decided upfront that they wanted to start a company. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason why that's one of my like favorite quotes for this year is that I, I think that's the approach that I'm gonna take to life next year. Like, one of the things on there was Allegra Partners. Mm. And I used that quote to like manifest what I was gonna do with that project, which could have become a company if I decided. But I chose not to because I wanted things to take a more natural and organic process to the way that they were built and they came about. Mm. And I think for someone like me is who's hyper organized, loves to plan things, I think it's gonna be interesting to allow myself to have a little bit more of a, an escape whilst also doing the things that are like fundamentally important to me. And it's something that my therapist has said, is like, look, I don't need to speak to you anymore. You don't need no sessions, you're, you're, you're whatever, whatever, whatever. And I was like, look, I, en- I enjoy speaking to my therapist so much that like, she's almost become a friend. Like mm. we just check in every quarter or whatever now. But the point being is that I allow thing, I think I'm gonna allow things to happen in a bit more of an organic way with, you know, background, like plans in mind. So yeah. Solid, man. Honestly, it's been such a privilege to go through this with you like, and man. learn so much again <laughs> about you from every all year. these things that happened every year, probably next year as well, which would be awesome just to 100%. to see the, the contrast. Yeah, especially we'll have, that's going to... Three years running. So yeah. there's this... I, well, as we're, as we're packing up, um, there's this idea that like in life, it takes about four years for anything to vest. Mm-hmm. So like, you know... Like what you did four years ago is probably like fully matriculated now. Like, and the, the closest example that I have is like when I went to uni, that's probably vested now. Like the university I went to, what I studied at school, that the job that that got me, then the promotion that that got me. Like it's safe to say no one, no one really asked me what I studied. No one cares what I studied. No one yeah. cares if I did or I didn't go because that period of my life is done now. And the, the guy was saying that like, take when you want to retire, minus the age you currently are and divide that by four Mm. as a vesting period that tells you the number of shots you have on goal to like really change your life now so if i want to retire at 60 yeah i'm about 30 now 60 minus 30 divided by four seven and a half so i've got seven and a half genuine life-changing shots on goal I was like, yeah, that sounds about right. That's cool. <laughs> I, like that, I like that cool. frame. I like that. Frame. So when I think when I think about taking risks and taking opportunities, just over the next decade, mm-hmm. I would say, that's I'm gonna say to myself, is this one of the seven? And then just like conceptualizes things a little bit more. Like if it is, all in. Yeah. So, bro, it's been awesome. Actually, we have a tradition of having a hug at the end. Oh yeah. <laughs> now we can check back and see what happens in a year.